Hello there, and thank you for joining me for this week's edition of Telil 24-7. I'm your host, Adam Cook. On this week's show, we continue our conversations with Nova Scotia's provincial party leaders as I sit down with the leader of the Nova Scotia New Democratic Party, Claudia Chender. You're also going to hear from the Cape Breton Family Place Resource Centre about a new program the organization is offering for fathers and about new office space that's setting up shop in Lennox Passage. But we begin with an update on a park project that's planned for a culpable poor in Arishat. The Arishat Community Development Association has been working hard on this project over the past few years, including the depths of the pandemic, and they've made some significant progress in recent weeks. They've officially made a playground equipment purchase for the new facility, and they've received funding from private organizations as well as two levels of government. So, where does the park project go from here? To get the answers, I sat down with the director of the Arishat Community Development Association, Rochelle Sampson. Rochelle, thank you for coming back once again to Tale 24-7. Thanks for having me. Always a good time. Well, it's not often that we get to have an interview with so much good news, but you folks have had a lot of good news lately, especially about the park that you folks are hoping to set up near Ecole Beauport. And I want to begin by asking you about a major equipment purchase that the ACDA made just a few weeks ago and announced just a few weeks ago on your Facebook page. Can you tell me about what's coming to the playground and about the milestone you've passed in being able to make this purchase? Absolutely. So we have finally raised enough funds to comfortably go ahead and order the playground equipment, which um, I think it was probably last year or the year before we had put up a couple of designs on Facebook and let the community vote on which one they would prefer. So we went ahead with Play Power, who's a really well-known supplier for playground equipment. They've got really important pieces in there that touch to make sure that any type of child has a really inclusive play experience. So that was really important for us. So we were able to um, go ahead and purchase that equipment. It does hold a 31-week lead time, which, you know, is unfortunate. So we couldn't have it for this summer. But um, it's going to arrive next spring. And then once the ground defrosts, we're going to go ahead and uh, install that gear. Now let's talk a bit about the installation because this is an interesting process. You folks announced on your Facebook page for the Development Association that it's going to be a build day happening in May 2024, and for people watching that might not know what a build day is, the Port Hawkesbury Community Park 10 years ago had a similar process where they got all the equipment, literally started at 8 o'clock in the morning and had the park equipment set up at 6 p.m. that evening. Are we going to see something similar here? I hope so. Um, <laughs> it's a big project. They've said it's kind of like putting Lego pieces together. They promised us that it is, you know, it'll be a really great activity for the community to do together. And we've had some volunteers, you know, raise their hands and let us know that they want to be involved in that day, which is so great. Um, so... It, it, it will be a whole day of putting these pieces together from morning to hopefully that evening. And, you know, by the next day, you'll have kids playing on that structure, and it's going to feel so good to see that happen. And just one of the things we'll reference as well from the Port Hawkesbury example is that you don't need a bachelor's degree in engineering or a background in construction to put these pieces together. That's you right. could be doing something as simple as shoveling dirt and moving things around. You could be overseeing a table that hands out the different parts to people putting it together. So literally anybody can get involved here. Exactly. And that's really important to note. I appreciate you saying that because, uh, you know, I think some people really want to help. They've wanted to help all along. Um, and so next year will really be the moment that they can get in there and and just do what they're comfortable doing and and help us in any way that they can hopefully by then it won't just be the playground going up there'll be other structures that will be installed so there'll be all kinds of stuff for, for volunteers to help us do now this isn't integral to the discussion we're having but I just found it interesting with the Port Hawkesbury example, they got their equipment from a group called Let Them Be Kids, which had also helped an additional playground set up in a different part of Cape Breton. And the build day was part of the condition of receiving that equipment. Is that the case here, or is that just something that you and your association have decided would be a good idea to do? No, actually, yeah, it's just something we talked to Proxbury. We've talked to the mayor of Proxbury and, and the people who work there um, all along the way, just to get more information on how it went, what works for them, what doesn't work for them, what's it costing them. 
So, and one of the things that they said that really worked out for them was this community build day. So we just decided to kind of take that on and, and do it because they said it's, it's a really great moment for your community to come together and put it together. It feels so much better than just kind of, you know, even though sometimes when you're handed something, that's also lovely, very, you know, that's very nice too. Um, but they said it, it really brought everybody together. It brought the parents together. It gave everybody a sense of purpose, like they did this for their community, which, which I really, really loved that that feeling that they got and so that's kind of where we got that idea so there's no requirement for us to do it it's just something that we'd, we'd love to do well i look forward to seeing it coming together and in the meantime part of the excitement around the park project right now is that you're getting all kinds of community support one of the most obvious examples comes from st joseph's credit union and they presented the association with a one hundred thousand dollar donation from their CED program. Can you tell me a little bit about that and about just the excitement of them coming on board? Absolutely. So <clears throat> they have a CED program, which I believe is Community Economic Development. Um, and so we were waiting to get enough funds that we felt like our project was really concrete before applying. Um, and so now we've come a very long way. We have, you know, a couple of thousands of dollars, which is great. Um, and so we applied to the seed fund for um, you know, a, a lesser amount. We applied for ten thousand dollars, and they decided that the project is well on its way, and that they wanted to be a really big part of this project and a really big partner. And so they allocated a hundred thousand dollars for us, and that is one of their biggest um, grant amounts in in history for them. So that was like super cool to be a part of that, and it felt really good that you know they share that same value of what we're looking to provide for our community and think that the community deserve this and so it's really important to us to see that kind of community support it means we're headed in the right direction we're doing the right thing and we're giving the community something that you know they deserve but also something that it makes sense in theory it's not just you know it's going to look good on paper or look good on the ground it's really something they can use it's going to foster community involvement and it's really going to bring people together and this comes after a few years of community fundraising for the association as well, too. We remember the Chase the Ace that Brandon Boudreau was hosting on the Facebook page for the Irishat Community Development Association. And we remember that so many individuals and organizations have really come together to make this happen. So can you tell us a little bit about what it feels like to be getting to this point at the Park Projects planning stage where you've been able to order equipment and say, yes, there's going to be a build day coming this park is actually happening it is a relief um, but it is very very exciting we've been working tirelessly for probably three or four years now um, and along the way we've had really great support we had support from the community immediately which was wonderful and so to still be you know trusted three four years later that we're going to do this for the community and have the credit union come on with that kind of amount really solidified a reason for us to keep going um, and to keep working for this because you know it does get tiring it gets um, you hit roadblocks no matter what you're trying to do any kind of project you try and do so um, to have that little extra support is going to really help us continue I mean Clearwater Seafoods came on with a donation of five thousand dollars in the original part and they're going to give another five thousand at the end uh, the province came in at a hundred thousand the municipality came in at seventy five hundred we have another community group that came in at a hundred and fifty thousand so it's finally all really coming together and we're almost 50% of the way there financially and so we're, we're really pushing for the federal government to come on as a big partner and, and hopefully wrap this project up and, and get it moving in 2024. And in the meantime you're also getting support from the provincial and municipal governments. Uh, we remember the yeah. MLA for Richmond Trevor Boudreau unveiling a $100,000 provincial donation back in March. Just yeah. recently there was a grant extension provided by the municipality of Richmond County from their council to the Airshaft Community Development Association. So can you tell me what it means to be able to have the municipal and provincial governments on side, especially as you make this pitch to the federal government for funding as well? Well, it's vital. Um, so it really starts at a municipal level. The municipality needs to see your project as a priority, um, and they did right off the cuff. They, they, you know, they encouraged us, they provided us letters of support, and they even provided um, some financial funds to go towards this project. So in doing so, allowed us to go to the next step of provincial and say like, hey, we've got a municipal project here that we're working towards that, you know, we see as a priority and that the municipality is on board with, um, you know, what is it that you feel you can contribute? And so that's kind of how that process works. And so now, 
you know, and it's a million dollar project, it's a large project, and so I understand for the federal government it takes a little bit more time for them to say, okay, is this really going to happen, is this a concrete project, is this, you know, a bit of a dream, you know, w what is this, and so how do we get on board, and so we're hoping to see um, a partnership with them in the next six months or so. Their, their new rounds of funding will come out in September, so we're hoping to jump in around then. So as you're working towards that, what else happens now? I mean, the equipment's been purchased, it's on its way. So what can you tell me about what the next stages are for the park project? So uh, for the summer, we lighten up a little bit. We let the families, because, you know, every, every board member is a parent, a, a teacher, or a, you know, a community member of some sort with their own lives. So in the summertime, we take July, August to just relax, enjoy how far we've come for the year. Um, and then we hit the ground running again in September, which is when a lot of the funds, um, all the grants get released. So in the meantime, we have funding letters that go out. Uh, we're still approaching you know, community, local businesses to donate. We're still partnering with private foundations and funds to try to get some funds from them. Um, so the, it never really ends. You're kind of always chasing it. Um, but the next steps kind of keep rolling and you just keep working towards that end goal. Um, and so it, it's... The chase continues. <laughs> well, as we wrap up here, Rochelle, I want to ask you about the fact that not only has the community come together, not just recently, but in previous years leading up to this as well, they've come together during the depths of the COVID-19 pandemic when you couldn't hold public fundraisers and you couldn't go door to door or go to people's offices or homes soliciting for funds like this. The resolve of the community to be able to make this project happen and your association and its board to make this project happen, does that give you a lift as you look forward not only to the actual construction of the park but to other endeavors that the Development Association are doing to make Arishat and Almadan better? Absolutely, yeah. The fact that we were able to push through that, get creative, find ways to, to handle that, um, it really spoke volumes about the, the, you know, the members we had on that committee who did, you know, incredible work not only for the community but, but at large. You know, they really raised awareness for something that's so important, which is, you know, having inclusive experiences for people of all ages and all abilities. We are such a small community, but a mighty one. But we have people that range from, you know, babies to seniors, and everybody deserves to have access to opportunity. And we live in such a beautiful place and there's no need for us to have less options or less opportunity. So I think it's so important that this project um, really comes to fruition next year. All right, we've covered a lot of ground in a short time, as I thought we might. Do you have anything else you'd like to add about all of this just before we wrap up? Not at all. I think we're just so excited. This year we had some really great announcements, um, like purchasing the playground and that partnership, and so that kicked off our summer to, to be able to you know, take a little relax, a little pause, um, soak that in and enjoy it, and then it, you know, seeing this come to life next year, which is you know, not that far away when you think about it, um, it's, it's really exciting, so, so we're looking forward to that. Well, we appreciate you coming in to tell us all about it as we start this last summer in Isle Madame without a community park. That's right. So thank you so much, Rochelle Sampson, for giving me a couple of minutes here on Telil 24-7 today. No, thanks for having me. And now we continue our Telil 24-7 series of interviews with Nova Scotia's provincial political party leaders. We've already spoken to Tim Houston, the Premier of the province and PC leader, as well as Liberal opposition leader Zach Churchill. Now we're going to check in with Claudia Chender, who just passed the one-year anniversary of her leadership of Nova Scotia's New Democratic Party. And as we head towards the two-year anniversary of the provincial government here in Nova Scotia, we're also getting ready for a by-election that's taking place in Preston in just a couple of weeks' time. So here's what Claudia Chender has to say about all of this and about issues that are concerning her and her fellow NDP members. And we're pleased to welcome back to Telil 24-7, the leader of Nova Scotia's New Democratic Party. She is, of course, Claudia Chender. Claudia, thank you for making some time for us here at Telil today. Thank you so much for agreeing to chat. Well, it's good to have you here. And part of the reason that we have wanted to have you here is because we're coming up on a very significant anniversary in Nova Scotia politics. In August, it'll be the two-year anniversary of the election of the Tim Houston PC government. And we've just passed your one-year anniversary as being acclaimed to the leadership of the New Democratic Party of Nova Scotia. So in terms of being at the midterm point of this particular provincial government, how are you feeling about what's happened and what direction the government seems to be going in? You know, what are your thoughts as we approach this halfway point? 
Well, it certainly feels a little bit like Groundhog Day because we're in the middle of a by-election um, here on the mainland. And so we're knocking on doors in the heat of the summer again. Um, but, you know, I think my my main um, reflection on this midway point is that in general, as I travel across the province and talk to folks, um, life is getting harder. Uh, healthcare, access to healthcare, uh, attachment to family doctors, being able to find an open emergency room when you need one, that's getting harder and harder. Things are getting more and more expensive and people are looking for help. So it's definitely a time of struggle. Um, there, there is some good news on the immigration front, certainly uh, in the straight area. I know there's excitement about hydrogen and, and other economic development projects, but if you talk to people about what it's like to balance the budget at the end of the month, it's it's certainly difficult right now. We're going to get into each of these topics in a little more depth, but I want to pick up with you about the by-election campaign. You mentioned that, of course, is in the riding of Preston. And okay. it brings me back to a question that I asked the Premier when I interviewed him not long ago about fixed election date legislation that was put in place shortly after his government was elected. Mm -hmm. The issue being that the fixed election date is, again, in August. It's going to be on August 21st, 2025. I asked him if he was worried that having another summer election might disengage people from the voting process. He said that shouldn't be the case. What mm -hmm. are your thoughts on the idea that we have a fixed election date, but it's still in the middle of the summer? Well, I think it was a really cynical move on behalf of this government and and spoke at length at the time that that legislation was passed, as did many other uh, people, some who flew in from across the country as experts to warn that summer election dates are a real challenge to sort of civic engagement and to civic literacy overall. Uh, so I, I think it's really problematic. And I think, you know, we're seeing that at play in the timing of this by-election. When the premier was the leader of the official opposition, he tabled a bill to say that when uh, a seat is vacated, a by-election should be called within 30 days mm -hmm. because people don't have democratic representation. And of course, that seat uh, in Preston was vacated on April 1st. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think the people of that riding deserved an election on May 1st or even in early June. But instead, here we are in the middle of the summer. Uh, you know, I was out yesterday. I think it was probably about 30 degrees here. Nobody wants to sit and chat about politics. Uh, if they're home, they want to be cooling off or they want to be out, you know, out of the out of the city altogether. So I think it's really cynical. Um, but I think that there are obviously good political reasons for it. Summer elections always um, will favor an incumbent in most cases. And the premier certainly knows that. Uh, and, you know, they will favor the status quo. And so right now the status quo is our conservative government. So I think it's really, I think the move to fix election dates is good. Although of course the premier still has the power to call a general election anytime he wants. Uh, it's essentially a suggestion more than a binding authority. Um, but I think having it in the summer is very problematic. All right. Well, let's move on from that topic into a number of things that you brought up over the course of the first couple of minutes in your first answer, talking about affordability for Nova Scotians. And we're seeing that on a number of different levels. Uh, of course, the price of groceries going up, the price mm -hmm. of rent going up. Uh, we mm -hmm. saw carbon pricing instituted on July the 1st. So the price of gasoline and home heating oil is going up. Your thoughts on how the provincial government is handling all of this and what you and your party would like to see done differently and what you would do differently if you have the opportunity. Yeah, well, I think, again, it's a real disappointment. So what we've seen, especially in the last few months from from the premier and from the government is picking fights with Ottawa. And we understand that lots of people aren't happy with Ottawa right now. Lots of people might not be happy with the leadership in Ottawa. But the reality is, is that they make legislation and that legislation is binding. And saying we don't like it is not sufficient to get us out of it. And so we are rejecting funding for uh, 
the Atlantic Loop. We're rejecting funding to shore up the Isthmus of Chignecto, which is vitally important for our province. We abdicated our opportunity to make a better deal on carbon pricing for Nova Scotians. We had an opportunity to make sure that Nova Scotians would get rebated the amount of money that they spend. They still will be getting significant rebates starting this week. So we're glad to see that at least. Um, but the province decided to essentially throw a fit instead of having a conversation and Nova Scotians will pay the price for this. In terms of what should be done, we think there are a number of affordability measures that the government could implement right now. And we've been pushing for those. Uh, one, which we've been talking about for over a year now is to waive seniors and family pharmacare fees. Seniors in particular, many of them are on the provincial pharmacare program and it's not free. And in fact, it's not even very cheap. And the costs are front ended in the spring of every year. And we know seniors are not taking their medications because they can't afford them. That in turn has an impact on the healthcare system and of course on people's ability to pay the rent or to pay their overhead. Um, in terms of groceries, we've introduced um, a, an initiative to waive the tax on groceries. Many basics are not taxed. So milk and eggs and cheese and things like that, meat. But there are many items in the grocery store that are taxed. And for people who are counting their pennies at the register, which I think most people are right now, it makes a difference in their ability to afford things. Again, smaller serving sizes, prepared food, maybe a rotisserie chicken for a busy family. Those are all things that that do have tax now. Uh, the NDP government waived the tax on some essential items uh, when we were in power. It's, it's entirely possible and it could be done right now. And we need to ramp up uh, support for efficiency. Uh, fuel oil has skyrocketed in price even before the carbon pricing. We need to make sure people don't need to use it. And so in order to do that, that's a huge retrofit operation throughout the province. There's been some progress on that, but we need much, much more. Just want to pick up on the grocery topic for just a moment. You were talking about different serving sizes and how differently they're taxed. Yeah. I interviewed your caucus colleague from Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Peer, Kendra Coombs, for our sister program, Roundtable. And she brought up the example that uh, an entire watermelon isn't taxed, but slices of watermelon are taxed under the current system. So that discourages people from eating healthy and also from trying to bring in the food that they need and the food that their families need. Yeah, and we know that there are a lot of single people, a lot of pensioners um, who aren't going to buy a whole watermelon who aren't going to buy a big container of yogurt, who aren't going to buy a whole pineapple, things like that, They because they can't eat them before they go bad. So they're going to buy a smaller serving size and those are going to be taxed. And at this point, when we know that people are struggling just to eat three meals a day, there's no reason that that tax should be in place. I want to pick up on carbon pricing, which you mentioned just a moment ago, Claudia, and I am wondering if you're able to articulate for us your position and the NDP provincial position on carbon pricing. Do you mm -hmm. feel that this is a valid way to combat climate change? Do you feel that it just winds up putting more money on the backs of those who can least afford it to, in an effort to fight climate change? Basically, what are your thoughts on the very concept of carbon pricing? Well, you know, I'm not a scientist, I'm a politician. <laughs> Uh, and this really is the purview of science and science policy um, in terms of, you know, environmental impact. But what I would say is I think properly implemented, um, there is lots of scientific evidence that carbon pricing works. Unfortunately, you know, the indication that we've gotten is that the way it has been implemented in Nova Scotia through the federal backstop will potentially mean that people pay more than they receive back in rebates. And that, of course, is not the intention. The intention is that you feel the sticker price at the pump, that that will influence positive choices. We know for many rural Nova Scotians, many Nova Scotians in the straight area, they don't have a choice about whether or not to drive. There aren't other transportation op options, but they may have a choice what type of vehicle they drive, um, you know, things like that. They may have a choice of how many people are in their vehicle. So uh, it will uh, be uncomfortable. Uh, it may not be what we had chosen if if we were in a position to choose. But again, this is squarely in the purview of the federal government. And whatever we think about it, 
we have known for years that they were going to implement it. And so our job in the province was to determine the best way to um, help to ensure that we meet our climate goals, but at the same time, make sure that people can afford their lives in the meantime. And we think that the premier really abdicated that responsibility. Uh, he got mad instead of getting smart and proposing to Ottawa a made in Nova Scotia plan that priced carbon because the plan that he submitted didn't, which is why it was rejected. Um, and that made sure that we protected people's pocketbooks and ability to pay the bills. And they just didn't do that. On a similar note, Claudia, the Premier, as you'd mentioned, also took issue with the administration of the Atlantic Loop hydroelectric project. Four and a half billion dollars put on the table by Ottawa in April. He mm -hmm. and his Minister of Natural Resources and Renewables, Tory Rushton, had each said that they wanted a higher percentage being paid by Ottawa. Your mm -hmm. thoughts on the concept that the provincial government could be ready to walk away from this project and the resulting impact on power rates for Nova Scotians? Well, I think it's deeply, deeply concerning. And I think there was actually a lot of misinformation that continues to be spread on both of these files. Uh, you know, the premier said that he didn't want to do it because it would double power rates. There is no evidence that that is true. Nova Scotia Power refutes that claim. Um, and there is no independent evidence that has been supplied that says that that is the case. Uh, and on carbon pricing, of course, the premier decided to use taxpayer dollars to rail against the federal government without actually informing people of how it was going to roll out and when the rebate checks would come and what they could do to defray those costs. So again, we're seeing a government that is trading in um, anger and discontent, which is exactly what their federal brethren are doing. Um, and it might uh, make people mad and uh, create some changes at the polls, but it's not creating any changes in the lives of Nova Scotians. It's not getting essential infrastructure built, and it's not making life any cheaper, um, which are all things that we look to our provincial government to do. Your party obviously has been keeping an eye on the Tim Houston government's approach to health care in Nova Scotia. Both the Premier and the Minister of Finance have said that they're willing to keep putting the province into debt if it means taking care of health care issues. And we've seen some recent measures that have taken place, including an incentive program for doctors to take on more patients. But I'm just wondering, do you feel that the spending that's been happening, and we saw more of it in the recent budget, is actually getting to the places where it needs to get and making a difference in Nova Scotia's healthcare overall? I mean, not that we've seen. So we know that there's lots of money being spent and some people are benefiting from that. Um, we know that there was a welcome incentive for nurses um, and similarly for CCAs, but we have no evidence that that will make a difference overall in workforce issues that uh, plague our healthcare system. Um, and, you know, really what we see is a very limited idea of what healthcare is and how to fix it. You know, we have a Tory partisan in charge of our healthcare system who has no healthcare experience. We have lots of announcements about technological innovations and things that are coming down the road, but I have yet to talk to a single Nova Scotian who says, wow, healthcare's really gotten better in the last two years. The, the people who are unattached to care, who have no family doctor, continue that list continues to grow. People are not happy with urgent care where you have to make a phone call, uh, you know, when you're You've cut off a digit or your arm is bleeding to see if you can get in to see someone. Uh, that's not the way people expect healthcare to work. Um, and there's a very, as I said, limited definition of what healthcare is. So we have a skyrocketing housing problem. Every corner of the province I go to, from Glace Bay to Yarmouth uh, to you know the North Shore to Truro to the South Shore, people are talking about housing and the lack of housing. And that has never happened before. If people don't have housing, they can't be healthy. Um, if people can't afford groceries, they can't be healthy. So there's some fancy kind of frontline initiatives that the government is spending a lot of money on. But if we don't make sure that people are healthy at the start, you know, what they call the social determinants of health, which is recognized internationally as the basis for a healthy population, we're not going to make any progress. And I think the evidence is that 
we haven't really made any progress. We are not seeing an improvement in our health indicators. Uh, we're not seeing an improvement in our experience of accessing the healthcare system. And I think it's really time for a change of course so that we can make sure that individuals experience improves and that hasn't happened. Claudia Chinder, I'm curious about your personal feelings right now at the head of the New Democratic Party of Nova Scotia. Of course, you're only the second leader of the party since it was last in power under Daryl Dexter. You succeeded Gary Burrell just a year ago. What are your thoughts on the outlook for the NDP in Nova Scotia right now? I mean, obviously, you're making that pitch in Preston with the by-election happening there. But how does Claudia Chender's NDP differ from Gary Burrell's NDP or Daryl Dexter's NDP, or for that matter, simply as an alternative to the governing party? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, as I uh, travel across the province, which is what I spend most of my time doing these days, um, I, you know, what I hear from Nova Scotians is that they want a government that sees them, that understands them, and that helps them with their daily lives. Um, and they're disappointed in the current government, who, again, is picking fights and talking tough and making promises, um, but people aren't feeling that impact day to day. And that's really what our party is always about and has always been about, is making sure that people are taken care of, that people can rely on their government to create and preserve the social safety net that we've established for a long, long time, that we can grow the economy uh, in sensible ways that that meet our social and environmental uh, commitments, um, that we respect the long history of our province and our, our resource economy, and that we can protect and grow that in ways that are sustainable for the future. And that's a message that we see resonating across this province. Um, you know, we always have stood for the notion that government should be for everybody, not just for some. And I think what we see right now is a government that rewards their friends and punishes their enemies. And that's old school Nova Scotia politics. And I think people are tired of it. Um, and I think they're ready for something different. I referenced Kendra Coombs, your mm -hmm. Cape Breton caucus member, just a couple of moments ago. She has been in her position as the MLA for Cape Breton Centre Whitney Pier just over three years. And I just wonder now, as you're seeking to rebuild the NDP caucus, you're hoping for a rebuild starting with a, a victory in Preston in the by-election and continuing into the coming election. But what does someone like Kendra Coombs bring to your caucus and what kind of impact is she making for you and for the party in Halifax right now? Well, as you know, um, the history of our party runs right through Cape Breton Island. And so, yes. you know, we um, we we value uh, having representation on the island and having that perspective in our caucus immeasurably. Um, so Kendra is vitally important to our caucus, as Tammy Martin was before her, as many other representatives have been before them going back decades. Uh, and I'm on the island every chance I get. Um, I will certainly be there later in the summer. I got kind of railroaded by this by-election. Uh, but, you know, I think um, Cape Breton is in lots of ways, uh, of course, um, suffering the same challenges as the mainland and also seeing the same opportunities as the mainland but in lots of ways is different and different by virtue of geography and history and culture. Um, and so we are of course aware of that. And it's so important for us to have someone on the ground um, representing those concerns and bringing them back to our party as we are in this rebuilding mode. Um, and so uh, we're really grateful for Kendra. We're also um always uh, sort of astonished and impressed with her ability to do her job with two extremely small children. Um, and she does that uh, with a lot of grace and a lot of community connection. Um, and yeah, I'm really glad to have her. We do wish you all the best and we wish you and your party all the best as you head towards the August 8th Preston by-election date. 
And when you come through Cape Breton later in the summer, uh, we hope you'll consider making a swing through our part of Cape Breton Island. I will do my very best. I'd love to see you. Well, it's been a pleasure for us to have you here on our Talil Airwaves once again, and we wish you all the best through the rest of the summer and in the second half of the term. Claudia Chender, thank you for joining me here on Talil 24-7 today. Thank you for having me. Claudia Gender is the leader of the Nova Scotia New Democratic Party. We've been speaking to her via Zoom today. Stay tuned for more of Tell Ill 24-7 in just a moment. The Cape Breton Family Place Resource Centre has a new program for fathers in the Strait area. And they're going to be delivering that new program from new office space that the Resource Centre is setting up in Lennox Passage. To hear more about all of this, I'm joined now by Mitch McNutt, He's the director of the Cape Breton Family Place Resource Centre. His office is based in Sydney, but he spoke to us at the Talil Studios in Arishat. Here's that conversation with Mitch McNutt right now. We are pleased to welcome Mitch McNutt to our Arishat Studios here at Talil Community Television. Mitch, thank you very much for joining me on Talil 24-7 today. Oh, it's just a pleasure. It's a beautiful day in, uh, in Richmond County, so, so glad to be here. And Cape Breton Family Place Resource Centre does have its offices and locations and services offered not just in your main office in Sydney, but all the way around the island. So can you tell me a little bit about what the Resource Centre does, where it's located, and just give a little bit of background for folks who might not know it so well. Sure, we're located right around the island, um, Adam, and as you mentioned, we are in Sydney, but we also have um, an office in Sydney Mines. We have an office up in the north of the island in a little community called New Haven, which might be of, of uh, a recognition to some folks. On the way to Neal's Harbor. Uh, it, you pass the girls in Neal's Harbor and, and you'll hit New Haven. Yes. Um, uh, absolutely. Uh, we also have an office in Bedeck. We have one in Inverness. Um, we have one in Port Hawkesbury, which is actually on the move. It's on the move to Lennox Passage. So um, we'll soon be, sometime this month, July, we'll, uh, we'll be in that Lennox Passage office. So yeah, lots, lots of locations to, um, to service uh, our families and, and the various groups that we offer. And it's helpful to know too, you talk about that Port Hawkesbury office moving to Richmond County to mm -hmm. Lennox Passage. Yeah. So Cape Breton Family Place Resource Center has had that presence in the street area for many years. Yep. Why do you think it's important beyond just simply reaching out to different parts of Cape Breton Island? Mm -hmm. Why do you think it's important to service this specific area, the Strait of Canso, and to provide these kinds of services? Uh, sure. So we, we are Cape Breton Family Place Resource Center. So servicing the, uh, the families of Cape Breton is, is our raison d'etre. And so having that office or that location um, down in this part of the world is, is exceptionally important to us. Um, we want to be more than just, just in our name. We, we truly want to, to live um, having services available to families right across the island. And a big part of that, Adam, is, is us coming to you. It's not you coming to us. Um, and the, in the us coming to you, we really lower that barrier for a lot of people that we would service, whether it's through one of our home visiting programs or through one of our group offerings. Um, really want to make that transportation piece as, as minimal a barrier to participation as possible. So having that office in Lennox Passage is just so, so going to help us to continue to offer services to the, uh, the Richmond County area um, well into the future. One of the reasons that we have you here is to talk about a program that's been set up by the Resource Centre to help single fathers. And it actually has a local director, uh, someone that folks might recognize, Mitch David from here in Isle Madame. Mm -hmm. uh, he's the program coordinator. Can you tell us a bit about this program and the importance and the need for this program for single fathers at this time? Mm -hmm. And so actually one of the um, one of the things that I'll point out is it's, it's a dad's group and, and we would very much welcome dads that are not single fathers okay. as well. Um, but yeah, we do feel it's exceptionally important to support dads and their, in their role as parent. 
um, something that perhaps um, has not always had the support that that we feel that that we can we can so um, offer. Um, I think in bringing dads together in a way that we can focus on parenting, I believe that the strengths that that group will bring together will really offer a tremendous amount of um, support to the participants. I think um, that in addition to some of the resources that we'll bring, um, chiefly in um, the wonderful facilitators that, that we have that, uh, that work for Family Place and are a part of the Family Place team, I think we can really reach out into the Richmond County community and, and really help um, dads really get in touch with, with some of the um, supports that, that may not have always existed. Now, I'm just curious what kind of programming will be offered within this dads program. You talk about sure. regular get-togethers. Mm -hmm and supports you just mentioned, but yeah. what kind of supports Absolutely. could be offered through this program? Absolutely. Um, so one of, the, one of the great things about uh, coming together in Cape Breton is we'll, we'll do whatever we, what, what we always do when we come together as a group in Cape Breton. Um, we'll come together and have the opportunity to network socially. Sure. Um, so we'll start there and in the networking socially, we'll definitely have a bite to eat and maybe a cup of tea to go along with it. Um, but in addition to that, that, that lovely um, welcome and hospitality that, that we so um, try to participate in really as Cape Bretoners, um, in addition to that, that hospitality piece, um, as I previously mentioned, we know that people will come to us with all kinds of strengths we know that people come to us as the experts in their own lives. A big, big part of this coming together of, of dads um, and people in that role of dads is for them to tell us what their needs are. So really starting a group in and around a needs assessment piece. What is it that brings us together? Are there commonalities here? Are there, are there needs that, that the group's presenting that we can, we can all connect around? And how do we explore those? And how do we help you navigate maybe the systems that are out there to, to support you in your role as a dad? Um, in addition to that, as, as I said, Adam, we, we offer um, some just excellent facilitators of programs. And those facilitators have all kinds of, of training and tools. So they have the ability to bring in all kinds of um, uh, things that, that we really hope that the, uh, the dads group will find supportive. So absolutely bring, bringing forward um, almost curriculum type elements of um, I'm a dad who, whose partner is expecting a child. Well, I don't know anything about newborn children. Well, we, we have um, some lovely resources in and around what to expect when you're gonna be a new dad and, and some real basics around basic care. How do, how do you care for a little one? And a lot of times in caring for that little one, that's the most supportive thing you can possibly do for your partner. Um, and um, also as, as children age, and I'm a dad, and as you mentioned, perhaps I'm, I'm the, the chief caregiver in my child's life. But what if that child wakes up one morning and decides that school is no longer an option for them and they just don't want to go to school no more? Um, how do you deal, that, deal with that as a father in a way that's, that's not um, maybe detrimental even to the relationship that you have with the child? How do you deal with that in a positive relationship building way that results in the child feeling supported in, in what was otherwise maybe a school reluctance situation. Just to use as an example of you know, one of the things that comes up in parents' lives periodically. Mm. Um, yeah, absolutely. It seems like the approach that this father's program is taking and the approach that Cape Breton Family Place Resource Center is taking overall is that 
parenthood and fatherhood in particular is not a one size fits all situation. Mm -hmm. There are different experiences with the children, different challenges that the children face and different challenges that the parents themselves face. That seems to be the way that you folks are approaching it. Is that the case? Yeah, I, I would think in many ways, um, Adam, I, I would completely agree. I think the one thing, the one approach that, that I, I think that all would agree on is that fathers um, hold the well-being of their children very close to their hearts. And the way in which that support plays out can be very different and where the needs are and the need for resources are in, in those situations can really vary from family to family. But, but fathers loving their children and wanting to see their children um, have as full and, and wholesome a life as possible, I, I, do, I don't think that's something that necessarily varies a great deal. And you and I were talking just before the cameras started rolling about how fatherhood is sometimes connected to men's mental health issues and also to stereotypes that often follow the role of fatherhood, especially in rural parts of Atlantic Canada, the idea that a man of certain cultural background or certain rural stock is just expected to take a deep breath and keep going. So do you find that a program like this helps to destigmatize this type of thing to encourage even one or two people out there watching right now to say, you know what, maybe this is for me. Maybe there is some place that people will listen to what I have to say and listen to the problems that I have with this. Yeah, Adam, I, I think absolutely. Um, yeah, the, the, there, there's kind of a subject area that we could um, have an ongoing series on in many ways, um, as we were sort of discussing before the cameras started rolling. Um, yeah, uh, boys don't cry, man up. Yeah. I mean, the sayings can go on and on and on, which basically reinforces the um, stereotype that um, a man's man should ignore whatever it is they're feeling and um, stick to it, stay at it. Don't, don't, don't break to assess maybe how you're feeling about it. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think um, I think the group does address those kind of that that kind of stigma of of um, fatherhood in the sense that we very much are hoping to offer a space where men can absolutely address um, some of the feelings they might be having, and some of those feelings may well be feelings of vulnerability. Adam, they not might not be you know rugged individualist sorts of feelings. Yes. Yeah, lots of room for men to feel those things too. Mm -hmm. um, but absolutely, um, to be human is to feel vulnerable at times. And there's not always spaces for men to sort of explore those feelings as well. Um, so many of the places where men would traditionally gather, um, mm -hmm. particularly in our Cape Breton, um, often involve um, alcohol. Yes often and and absolutely i i personally like to go to the pub myself mm -hmm. um is that the place i should go when i'm feeling all sorts of things that might include vulnerability mm -hmm. um perhaps not perhaps there, sh there should be some spaces where i can um, explore some of the things i'm experiencing and feeling that that aren't centered around that um i think um, some of the other places that that men traditionally would gather not necessarily um, the best space to to really have some serious conversations about what it means to be a parent and what it means to be a dad. Yeah, nothing beats the value of a safe space for a conversation like mm -hmm. this. Yeah. So with that in mind, can you tell me about the progress of the program locally? Have these groups started meeting yet? Or if they haven't, how can people get involved? So yeah, we, we, we have started, um, um, Adam. We, we started a couple of weeks ago and we've had some, some participants out and we've absolutely had the opportunity to have some, some really um, lovely conversations. Um, and it's, it's not, not all, all serious kinds of, uh, of things where you feel like you have to come in and um, wear your emotions on your shirt sleeve. 
um, very much as you suggest, um, trying to be as safe a space as possible, really allow people to, to come as they are, and really, once again, recognizing that people are the experts in their own lives. Um, we've started the, uh, the group at um, Our Lady of Assumption Church Hall which is just uh, down the road from where we're sitting right now. Yes. Uh, and have been doing that at 1.30 on Tuesdays, weekly. Um, as soon as our Lennox Passage um, office is up and running, we've got a lovely, comfortable space with, uh, with some couches that, uh, that folks can, uh, can make themselves at home on, um, and we'll be moving the group to that, uh, that location as soon as our Lennox Passage office is uh, sand it and paint it and, and has some molding up and uh, a few things plugged into walls. So thinking oh. towards um, first week in August for that. All right, so that's coming up soon. We'll Pretty look forward quickly. to seeing the progress there. Yeah. And I just wonder now, has there been cooperation in terms of getting programs like this off the ground with, for example, the uh, Provincial Department of Health and Wellness, which now has a more keen focus on mental health issues as well, too. Uh, are you getting any help from the provincial or federal governments even in terms of just being able to have space set aside or certain programs delivered? Does Cape Breton Family Place Resource Center have that kind of a relationship with these levels? I, we absolutely do have a relationship um, at those levels. Um, they would be funding partners of ours. Mm -hmm and um, recognizing um, the importance of, of parents uh, and, and well-resourced parents uh, in our communities is absolutely um, one of the priorities that we've always felt with our, our federal and provincial partners. Mm -hmm. um, so ab absolutely feel that support from those, those departments, Adam. All right, good to hear. We've covered a lot of ground in a short time about all of this, Mitch, as I thought we might. Did you have anything else you wanted to add just before we wrap up here? No, Adam, really want to thank you um, for, for having me down, for the, uh, the opportunity to, uh, to sort of speak about the men's group and to, or the dad's group and to um, kind of get the word out into the community. Um, and, and really looking forward to seeing this, this group grow in the coming months and years. Family Place is very committed to, um, to seeing this support um, continue on in the Richmond County community. And, and so we're, we're, our intention is to, uh, to be at this for the foreseeable future. So. Well, it's our pleasure to have this conversation with you and to hear all this information that the program is up and running and it'll settle into the new office in Lennox Passage. So we wish you all the best for all of that. And in the meantime, thank you, Mitch McNutt, for joining me today on Tale Hill 24-7. Perfect. Thank you, Adam. All right. Mitch McNutt is the director of Cape Breton Family Place Resource Centre. We've been speaking to him here at our studios at Tale Hill Community Television in Arishat. And there you have it. That wraps up this week's edition of Talil 24-7. Thank you for tuning in, and a big thank you to my interview guests this week, Claudia Chender, Rochelle Sampson, and Mitch McNutt. If you have any thoughts about what you've seen over the past hour here on Talil 24-7, or you'd just like to make some suggestions for a future edition of the show, I'd love to hear them. You can contact me directly. My phone number is 902-625-8863, and you can reach me by email using the address adamjrcook, cook with an e, at gmail.com. You can also contact Talil Community Television directly with your ideas and your comments. The station phone number in Arishat is 902-226-1928, and the best email address to use is talil at talil.tv. And don't forget that you can follow Talil on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok, and our YouTube channel features every single episode of Talil 24-7, including this one, as well as individual interviews and segments from our shows, and we offer the same service for our sister program, Roundtable. For now, I'm Adam Cook. Thank you for joining me for this week's edition of Talil 24-7. I look forward to seeing you again next week with a brand new show. Bye for now.